This weekend, um, we honor the life and legacy of Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And tonight, our church is uh, part of an event called Come Unity, an evening of inspiration, of hope, and challenge. Um, and so, it's at Chase Oaks Church in Plano, and we'd love to have you guys join us to come experience the power of scripture, spoken word, a panel discussion, I'm going to be a part of that, on race and reconciliation in the church, to hear the power of multi-ethnic, multi-denominational choir united with one voice, one spirit, one sound. You know, as a pastor of a multi-ethnic church, multicultural church, I'm grateful that we're part of this event, that we're trying to live out what it means to be a diverse community of people that together loves and worships Jesus and cares for each other. I'm grateful that there are people in our community that come from all different parts of the world. Some of you immigrated here yourself, maybe as a child, maybe as a student, maybe you came here as an adult to work. Um, some of you are sons and daughters of immigrants. Others of you, you were born and raised here. Um, you're here from Asia, from Central America, from Europe, from the US, from Africa, from Haiti. And I can say from the bottom of my heart that this community of people, each of you that call Off City your church, regardless of where you were born, regardless of your racial identity, I can say that you are my family. Your family. On my drive home on Thursday, um, my phone started beeping with those um, CNN news alerts, and I was like, oh, wait, what's going on now? And I learned that in the Oval Office, in the hallowed ground of American politics and aspiration, our president reportedly made racist and troublesome comments regarding immigrants and their countries of origin, my family. Listen, I'm a pastor, I'm not a politician. But I'm a pastor of a particular group of people with diverse and rich backgrounds. You contribute to our church in immense ways. You are our church family. My job is to shepherd you. And as I shepherd you, that means I am to feed you, I am to lead you, I am to protect you. And as a shepherd, I cannot abide by the comments that our president makes regarding immigrant peoples and their countries of origin. I cannot leave them alone to these racist barbs, these evil speech, this provocative comments, this blasphemous slander against the image and likeness of God in which each of us are made. And as followers of Jesus, we believe that all humanity, whether they are from Asia or US or Africa or Haiti, that we are all made in the image and likeness of God and therefore every person is worthy of respect and dignity and esteem. And we are called to love because Jesus tells us that we will be known as followers of Jesus by how we love, by how we love. And listen, there are certain roads that love cannot take. Love cannot take the road of discrimination. Love cannot take the road of hate. Love cannot take the road of oppression. Love cannot take the road of racism. Love cannot take the road of racial and gender bias. And as a nation preparing to honor the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, I remind all of us that claim to be followers of Jesus, of Dr. King's admonition to speak up against injustice, to work for human dignity, to speak up for peace, to work for equal justice for all humanity. Dr. King was most disappointed by those who called themselves Christians when they would tell him, to wait for a more judicial time for action. Listen, today it's clear that we cannot wait. And as your pastor, I call you that if you truly believe that people of all dignity have value and worth, not just in your own eyes, but in the eyes of God, that we are not only to speak, but to work together to rid our nation of systemic injustice to register, to vote, to hold those who are not in solidarity with basic human dignity and justice to account. Acts of charity and songs of unity will not be enough to dismantle the structural injustice that exists in our country. 
We cannot allow such hatred to stand unchallenged, and we cannot be silent or inactive in the faces of words and actions that violate the Christian mandate to love every person who was created in the image of God. To paraphrase various speeches of MLK, I refuse to believe that we are unable to influence the world around us. I refuse to believe that we are bound by racism and war and injustice. I believe that we are bound, that each of you are my brothers and my sisters. I believe in dignity every day and our brokenness can be healed. I believe that we can overcome oppression and violence and racism without resorting to it. That means I seek to reject revenge, reject re retaliation, reject racism. I remember the words, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can. The promotion of racial fear and hate and the justifying of it are not just partisan political issues. These are gospel issues. And confessional resistance on your part and my part to that message is now required by faithful followers of Jesus. This is not merely an electoral debate in which Christians hold a different policy view from other people. Rather, it's a public test of, your, of Christian truth and discipleship. Inflammatory messages of racial, religious, and national bigotry compel resistance from followers of Jesus who believe that the image of God is equal in all humanity. We hold up the call to love Christ in the encounter with one another, and we believe social justice is an integral component of the way of Jesus leading inevitably to speak up for our neighbor against political attacks especially by leaders and governments. Listen, racism is a sin against the Holy Spirit. It overtly opposes the work of God in the world, and we Christians are called to stand up for our neighbors. We must uphold the principle in both our personal and public lives of the golden rule that we should treat others in the way that we ourselves want to be treated. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German pastor, theologian, said silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And so we're called to speak. We're called to act. We're called to say enough is enough. We're called to say we demand better, we expect better. Not as a political group, not as a partisan voice, but because we are followers of Jesus who shed his blood for all humanity. And we can use the opportunity of speaking clearly about what we're against to demonstrate and lead by example on behalf of what we are for. We can do no other. Let me call you to a sense of worship as we go into the word this morning. Brothers, sisters, rejoice. We live sustained by God's presence and God's love. Thanks be to God. As we mourn the wounds of racist and hurtful words, God weeps with us. As we give thanks for brothers and sisters from every tribe and every nation, God gives thanks with us. As we struggle for justice, God struggles with us. As we strive for peace, God strives with us. As we work to build a beloved community, God works with us. As we offer our gifts and love and time and support to all people, God blesses us. Brothers, sisters, rejoice. Sustained by the power of God's presence and love, we truly worship God. This morning, we're going to see in our text a Jesus that is caring, that cares about people that the world would just simply take advantage of, the world would simply reject. Our text is John 8, and we're going to be looking at verses 2 through 11. We're jumping back in the book of John after taking November, December off. Um, and we'll probably be in John for the rest of this year, minus the summer. 
um, and we're hoping to finish it up by the end of this year. God willing. Um, one thing that is clear from the Gospels is that God's deepest intention toward us is mercy. And how can it be otherwise? If God's intention was anything else but mercy, we, we shouldn't be here this morning. We should have just stayed home. If God's intention was for us to get our act right, to get over our sins, to get live a perfect life, we might as well shut this whole thing down because we'll all fail. Apart from mercy, we find ourselves in a deep, dark chasm and no amount of pressing, no amount of pushing, no amount of striving, no amount of shoving out the, out the darkness is going to make the light succeed. The only way to remove darkness is to have light shine and fill the chasm that it will push the darkness out. Darkness cannot resist the light. And the light is what the Bible calls the mercy of God found in the person and work of Jesus. It is God withholding from you and I what we rightfully deserve. See, Jesus was so full of compassion and mercy, and we've already seen this in the book of John. It's like he's looking for ways to show mercy. It's like he's looking for ways to show love to people, looking for darkness to shine light on, looking for sins to forgive. We saw this when he approached his disciples. We saw this in his conversation with Nicodemus, with the woman from Samaria that everyone had rejected, the official son, the man who was paralyzed for 38 years, who lay by the pool of Bethesda. The way he fed the 5,000 people, the way he walked on water to save the disciples, and here with this woman that's been caught in adultery. Jesus is just looking on people for people that he could just love on, to forgive, to embrace, to welcome into his community. And one of the most profound places that we see the mercy and the compassion of Jesus is in the Gospels in Luke 19, where Jesus is walking toward the city of Jerusalem for the beginning of the Passion Week, the week right before his last week on earth. And Luke records how Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, even though he knows that the residents of that city is going to crucify him. And the language in Luke 19 is that Jesus' body is visibly shaking as he wails over a city that's going to reject him, not out of fear, but out of compassion and love for the people of that city. You know, in the Old Testament, if you read a, the book of Jonah, you'll see a prophet who finds himself in a very similar situation near the city of Nineveh. But Jonah runs away from the city in bitterness. Jesus runs toward the city in tears. Jonah looked at the city and got mad because of their sin. Jesus looked at the city and mourned over it. Jonah sat under a tree and cringed at the repentance of the city, calling for justice from God. Jesus hangs on a tree and cries out for mercy in God to forgive them. Jonah completes the mission reluctantly. Jesus completes the mission with the joy that set before him. Jonah about died for the mission that he hated. Jesus actually was murdered for the mission that he loved. In his mercy, this compassion, this care that Jesus readily shines on us is the only thing that's going to move our hearts to love him even more. But as we look at the world, we have a problem because while we want to see the mercy of God, there's also such a great need for justice. Injustice is rampant everywhere. Innocent people are dying left and right in, in crimes of passion, crimes over money, crimes over gang status, crimes over land, even crimes over feeling over religious supremacy. Shootings, bombings, suicides seem to be on the front page of news, of news articles every single day. And so, like I said, we have a problem, a dilemma. It was Jonah's problem. How can God bring justice and yet at the same time show compassion and mercy? How can he uphold the law and yet at the same time show love? In our passage, we meet the religious leaders who, again, they try to trap Jesus. They realize the tension and think that they have Jesus cornered. He has either has to be about justice or he has to be about mercy. He either has to be about the law or he has to be about love. He either has to be about judgment 
but he has to be about compassion. And as Jesus encounters this woman caught in adultery, is he going to uphold the law or is he going to break the law? Will he bring justice? Will he, will he bring mercy? Either way, the religious leaders think they've got Jesus, that there's no way that he's going to get out of this. And so thinks the religious leaders. If Jesus brings justice, if Jesus says stone her, then we've got him for a liar because this is the Jesus that said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. And yet when you come to him all broken with your sins exposed, rather than give you mercy, he says, strike you down. His justice absorbs his mercy. But if Jesus actually shows mercy, then we got him as a lawbreaker because the law says that, because Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. And the law says that someone that's committed adultery should be put to death. And so they've got him. Either he's a liar or he's a lawbreaker. He can't be just and merciful at the same time. But Jesus is absolutely brilliant in how he deals with them. You see, Jesus is full of compassion and justice. He doesn't compromise either one, as we're going to see in our text. I'm going to do something a little different from what we normally do. I'm going to share the story. We're going to read the passage together, just share some points. And at the end, I'm just going to give you like a couple application points from this passage. Some of you in your Bibles, you might see a footnote that says, hey, this passage wasn't in the original manuscripts, but this passage is in my Bible, so I'm going to teach it. So I'm not going to compromise on that. So I'll leave it to the scholars to debate whether it belongs there or not. So, um, so let's look at the story together. Verse 1. Verse 2. Early in the morning, he came to, again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Jesus had left the temple the day before after the Feast of Tabernacles and had gone to the Mount of Olives. More than likely, he went there to spend time praying and communing with God, which he often did. And at daybreak, he returns to the temple, and we find the people are still very interested in Jesus. They are fascinated by him, and they surround him. The crowds are gathering around him, and the idea is they just kept coming and coming, and Jesus taught them because he loved to teach them. He loved to pour into the lives of people. Verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. It wasn't long before... Jesus got into his teaching that things got cut short. The crowd on the fringe heard a commotion behind them. The religious leaders were approaching bells and everything. You, can, you knew they were coming. And there was this stern look on their face telling everyone to move aside. And like the Red Sea, the crowd parted ways and the religious leaders now approach Jesus. But if you see their faces, you could see that something isn't right. There's someone there that doesn't belong with this religious leader. There's a woman there. But this woman wasn't grim like the other women, like the other men, the Pharisees and the scribes. This woman was downcast. Tears in her eyes as she was virtually being dragged through the streets by these religious leaders. The crowds begin to murmur. The voices, sounds of voices begin to rumble through the crowd. What's going on? Who is this woman? Why do the religious leaders look like they just drank another cup of lemon juice? Why are they so rushed? Why are they so irate? If you were in the crowds that morning, you were probably standing on your tippy toes. If you were short like Zacchaeus, you were trying to find the closest tree to climb on to catch a glimpse of what was happening. Something was very wrong about this whole scene. What did this woman do? Why is she crying? Why are the men mad? As you look closer, you see some of the younger religious leaders with stones in their hands. And you begin to realize that things are about to go south. And then you catch a glimpse of Jesus, who never flinches even for a moment. It was as if he could see right through these religious leaders and see their hearts. These religious leaders form a pack, form a circle like a pack of wolves around this broken woman, and Jesus is standing in front of them. She's left alone, head bowed, avoiding every eye contact in the center of the conflict. And so the scene is set. You have a crowd that's intrigued. You have a woman that's broken. You have 
angry religious people and you have a merciful Savior. Verse 4. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now the language there tells us that the woman has been caught in the actual act of adultery. They didn't just see her walking out of a room with another man. They had caught them actually doing it. They were caught. Now this is virtually impossible because it's not normal to barge into someone's bedroom. You see, this was a setup. This woman, even though she was guilty, she was set up by religious leaders. This is an entrapment, a deceit, a lynching, if you will. A trial was required by the law, but no trial was given. There was no need for her to be brought out in public, but they dragged her out for everyone to see. And the last time I checked, it takes two to commit adultery. Where's the man? He either ran as fast as he could, or these religious leaders let him go because more than likely, he was actually one of the religious leaders. Judging by Jesus' statement later in our passage, the guilty man was in their midst. He had coerced this woman to have sex with him and his buddies break down the door and catch him. See, they didn't care about this woman. She was just a pawn in their game of trying to kill Jesus. I mean, they tried everything to kill Jesus. They tried to catch him eating on the Sabbath or healing people on the Sabbath and accuse him of not following the law. They asked him about taxes to say that he's revolting against Rome. They asked him about divorce. They accused him of being Satan or one of his workers. They accused him of being crazy, mad, egocentric, or a rebel, a charlatan, a disruptor of the peace. They called him a legit, legitimate child. They called his mom basically a prostitute, his dad a wimp. They accused him of eating with sinners. They accused him of rejecting Moses and Abraham. Tried to, they tried to throw him off a cliff. They tried to stone him. They tried to hire one of his disciples to betray him. They arrest him on trumped up charges. They lie to the Romans claiming to want to th that he wants to overthrow them. They incite the crowds to turn on Jesus like sharks sensing blood on the water. They get into a frenzy to make sure the Romans actually do kill him. But this, this is an all-time low. You see, they tried to arrest him the day before, but the guards came back saying that no one speaks like this man. And so now they take matters into their own hands. Thus they, they connive, they conspire, they slither their way to Jesus with this woman. Can you imagine the shame of this woman as they tell everyone the sin that she's committed? This wasn't a private matter. The whole crowd heard what she did wrong. Can you imagine the commotion in the crowd as they mumble to one another, lacking sympathy, condemning this woman in their minds. Can you see them shaking their heads in disgust? Can you see the smirk on the faces of the religious leaders? Verse 5. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? Listen, you need to understand that these guys had a point. Although they might have been self-righteous hypocrites, the law stated that those who caught in adultery were to be put to death. Leviticus 20, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress should be put to death. You say, Sam, wait. It says right in those verses that those who commit adultery are to die. Isn't that harsh? Listen, you need to understand that God made such rules for the nation of Israel to protect the sanctity of marriage and family. The implication for us is that God is dead serious about not only our testimony to the watching world, but also our joy. He has made us sexual beings so that marriage becomes an intimate, personal relationship, different from any other relationship invented. Sex was given to bring joy, intimacy, unity into marriage. To go outside of marriage with sex was deadly to the family 
and to society. The whole family unit would fall apart. The building block of society. Sex was never meant to be a consumer good. It was meant to be a covenant good. In a consumer relationship, it's like a vendor, and you relate to them as long as they're giving you a good price. We've had cable TV for years. A month ago, they, our promo expired, so I called Frontier and said, hey, I am not paying this ridiculous amount. They're like, well, this is the rate. And I said, well, we're done with you. We're done. So effective tomorrow, my kids don't know that yet, but there's no more cable at the house <laughs> because we're not paying for it. Netflix will work fine. YouTube will work fine. Um, but that's a consumer relationship. A covenant relationship is completely different. While a consumer relationship says, you adjust to me or I'm out of here, the covenant relationship says, I'll adjust to you because I made a promise to you and God, and the relationship is more important than just my needs. The consumer mentality of our culture turns sex into a weapon that destroys relationships, destroys lives, destroys our self-image, leading to all kinds of eating disorders, body issues, destroys families, and even destroys souls because our body and our soul are connected. It was meant to be a covenant good, a marriage good that brings unity, vulnerability, freedom, and intimacy. Look back at the text. Jesus, the religious leaders look at Jesus and throw the ball into Jesus' court. The question was emphatic. Jesus, what do you think? What do you think we should do? You can imagine the crowds now again parting away, parting again, but now they're revolving around Jesus. They want to hear what Jesus has to say. It's almost, it's almost like an old Western showdown, right? Jesus on one side, these religious leaders on the other side, this woman caught in the middle, and everyone's just waiting to see who's going to go down. If he says stone her, then everything that he's taught about mercy and forgiveness seems to be just a bunch of hot air. And also, if he says to stone her, he's going to go against Roman law, which states that the Jew Jewish people couldn't execute anyone. The leaders knew this, and they're trying to trap Jesus. But if he says, let her go, then he would be guilty before the leaders and the law, which said that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And thus, he would have been condoning injustice and encouraging people to do whatever they want to do there's no law. You can do, you're free to do whatever you want. And so Jesus, in their minds, will either have to give up the life of the woman or give up his teachings on compassion or break the law of Moses. And what they didn't know was Jesus was going to save the life of the woman, show compassion, and still uphold the law. He wasn't going to just sweep the sin under the cosmic rug of the universe and be unjust. And he wasn't going to have the woman killed and be unsympathetic. He was about to show that he is both just and the justifier. Verse 6. This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Notice Jesus doesn't even say a word. He just bends down and begins to doodle in the sand. The entire crowd leans in to see what Jesus is doing, and the words echo in the back of the crowd. What is he writing? Is he, what's he doing? What in the world did he write? We have no idea. It doesn't matter. But what we do know is John put it in there because John himself was a witness of it. Verse 7. And they continued to ask him. They continued to pester him. He stood up and he said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And the leaders become annoyed at Jesus' lack of response. They kept repeating the statement to Jesus, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Should we stone her? Should we not stone her? And it's clear that the tension is high in the temple. All eyes are on Jesus as he begins to draw in the sand. And the crowds are like, Jesus, stop making sand castles and tell us what you think. And Jesus gets up and he uses an imperative, commanding them to throw a stone at the woman, but on one condition. If you are without guilt, throw the stone. Now listen, Jesus isn't saying that only a sinless person could execute judgment. Jesus is basically saying, listen, I know your deceit. I know what you're doing. He knows I know that you are trying to set me up and all of you are guilty in this. They weren't here to bring justice. They were here to trap Jesus. 
they were just as guilty as this lady in that they conspired to make the sin happen. The very law they invoked are the law that is the law that they are breaking. Now notice Jesus never says to not throw a stone and never denies punishment. He's simply saying that, listen, you are disqualified as witnesses and executioners because you are just as guilty because you tried to entrap this woman. Verse 8. And once again, he bent down and he wrote on the ground. Jesus gives him an answer. And he goes back to making his sandcastle in the sand. He's, and he leaves and he ignores them. And no doubt the religious leaders all look at each other speechless. They knew that Jesus knew what they were doing and what they had done. They were guilty. One by one, they began to walk away while the woman cringed, her head covered in her hands, waiting for a rock to be thrown at her, wondering, is it going to hit me in the head first? Is it going to hit me in the stomach? Is it going to hit me in the leg? Am I, is it going to take long for me to die? And to her amazement, with head bowed, she peeks out, out of the corner of her eye, and she sees sandals walking away from her. They leave. Verse 9. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Notice the older ones went first. Why? Because just give it a little time, my friend, and you who are young will discover that you are just as broken and sinful as anyone else in the world. It's young guys who are the most judgmental, right? You think that everyone is wrong. It's black and white for you, but the older you get, you realize there's a lot of gray and there needs to be a lot of grace. It's the young men especially who had a hard time coming to grips with their own sinfulness and their own self-righteousness. Pride is the young man's disease. And all of a sudden, the woman couldn't see any feet around her. The crowd was silent. The only sound she heard was the sound of rocks falling to the ground and the shuffling of feet as the crowds, as the religious leaders left. And she lifts her head ever so slightly as if a hundred pounds had been put on her head and she turns her head in every direction and she sees the eyes of the crowd staring right at her and she looks and sees the backs of her, their, of her accusers and rocks, and rocks scattered all over the way as they leave. And she turns around, and there's a small smile creeping up on her face, and she turns, and she still sees Jesus there. And all of a sudden, the smile is gone. And there's this empty feeling in her gut that says, why is he still here? Why didn't he go away with the rest? In her gut, she's like, can he kill me? Verse 10, Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Jesus looks at her in the eyes as the crowds gasp. This is the first time that she's probably seen Jesus as she most likely never looked out of shame. And he does something that no one else does in this story. He talks to her. He speaks to her. Until then, this woman was just an object, an object to be destroyed, an object to be used, a pawn in the hands of the religious leaders. Can you imagine the emotional mess that this woman was? She was on a roller coaster ride of emotions. She knew she was going to die. And apparently this man was able to judge her. But how? Was he better than the others? Was he not part of the conspiracy? How can he still be standing there? The answer is that he was the only one there without guilt. Thus he could have judged her. He could have thrown a stone at her. And he would not have been wrong. Verse 11. She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Listen, Jesus had every right to condemn her, but she, he didn't. Did he just sweep the sin under the rug? He could have said he justifies her, but was he just? What about her sin? 
Are there not consequences to sin? You say, Sam, can't Jesus just forgive her and move on? What's the problem with that? Why can't you just forget about it? I want you to imagine that you're part of that crowd that morning. You see all the religious leaders walk away one by one. And in the silence that morning, you hear the sound of muffled crying. And it's not coming from the woman in front of Jesus, but the woman that's standing right beside you. She has two little kids clinging to her feet, asking, Mama, why did Daddy do this? Why did this woman take Daddy from us? She's torn on the inside. She's on the verge of insanity with anger boiling up inside of her. It's hurt. It hurts and it's not okay. And Jesus knows that. She cries to Jesus and says, but that's not fair. You don't know what she's done to me. You don't know what she's done to my family, to my kids. How can you just let her go free? And Jesus looks at her with loving, patient, merciful eyes and says, you have no idea what you've done to me. In six months, justice will be served. The sin that she committed, your husband committed, and everyone in this area has committed, I will pay for You see, those men are coming back, and next time they won't come back with stones for this woman, but they'll come with an old rugged cross for me. I will be scourged, I will be mocked, I will be nailed to a cross and die for not a single thing I've ever done wrong. It will be a complete travesty, it will be complete injustice, it will be a lynching then. You see, her sin will not be swept under the cosmic rug of the universe. God will judge her sin, but instead of pouring out judgment on her, he will pour it out on Jesus instead. This was the only way for God to destroy sin without destroying us in the process. You see, sin was dealt with. It was judged. Jesus, as it were, gave this woman a stone, and he said, why don't you just take the stone and throw it at me? I will die in your place. I'll take the punishment for you. You see, Jesus doesn't say that she's not guilty. He says she's not condemned. In Jesus, you're guilty, but you're not condemned. It cost Jesus his life to say that to her. And it cost him his life to say that to you and I who believe. What do we learn? Four things from this story that I want to just point out to you really quick four applications number one adultery has serious consequences adultery has serious consequences sex is a wonderful thing created by God to be enjoyed within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman on a cold night in the woods a campfire is great and satisfying but if you remove from the fire the barriers you set the whole forest will be up on fire, and now you're in trouble and your whole life is threatened. Having said that, let me say this. If you have been sexually promiscuous in the past, and you've come clean with Jesus and repented, you are not a second-class citizen. You are not a second-class Christian. If you wonder if Jesus could ever use you or draw near to you, just look at the lineage of Jesus. We saw this in December. The the genealogy of Jesus was filled with people that were screwed up. There was David, the adulterer, but Sheba, the adulteress, Solomon, the womanizer, Judah, the John, Tamar, the prostitute, Rahab, the, Rahab, the prostitute. These are all part of Jesus' family. Look at the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. There was Rahab, the prostitute, David, the adulterer, Samson, the man that could never keep his pants on. And when you come to Jesus, he doesn't just... He doesn't just take your sin upon himself on the cross. He also removes your sins. Not just the fact that he removes the judgment of your sins, but he also removes the presence of sin in your life so that when God sees you, he sees you pure and holy in Jesus. Second thing we see here, Jesus elevates the status of women. Jesus elevates the status of women. The religious leaders didn't care a bit about this woman, as was the case with women in general in that culture. It was a common practice in that culture that men would sleep around on their wives and a man could divorce his wife for any or whatever reason. This wasn't how it was supposed to be as the woman was made in the image of God. 
Many people look at Christianity and see it as oppressive toward women and archaic, but it could be further from the truth. Christianity radically was radically countercultural. The New Testament put women in place of honor and respect. Rodney Stark, a historian, in his book said this about women. It was extremely common in the Greco-Roman world to throw out new female infants to die from exposure because of the low status of women in society. But the church forbade its members to do so. In the Greco-Roman society saw no value in an unmarried woman and therefore it was illegal for a widow to go more than two years without remarrying. But Christianity was the first religion to not force widows to marry. Greco-Roman widows lost all control of their husband's estate when they remarried, but the church allowed women to maintain their husband's estate. And finally, Christians didn't live in cohabitation. If a Christian man wanted to live with a woman, he had to marry her. And thus, it gave the woman greater security, knowing that he couldn't just leave her. Also, the Greco-Roman double standard of allowing married men to have extramarital sexual affairs and mistresses was forbidden by the church. In all these ways, Christian women enjoyed greater security and equality than any other women in their surrounding culture. Christianity empowers women. Number three, grace empowers you against sin. Grace empowers you against sin. Notice the order of Jesus' statement. When he speaks to the woman, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Listen, you cannot defeat sin by just trying to go out and not sinning no more. You will fail miserably. Some of you that are struggling with sin know that you, if you just simply try to overcome sin by trying harder, you will keep failing. You have to go back to the cross. You have to see that your status is one of no condemnation. You are free. You are forgiven. Now let that joy move you to obey Jesus. The fight is not about more willpower, but about more rejoicing, more marveling, more satisfaction in the person and work of Jesus. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no condemnation to those of us who are in Christ Jesus. This is where the power comes for us who are followers of Jesus If you go to the law and you hear, obey and you'll get it. Or if you go to the law and hear grace that says, you're mine, you belong to me. I bought you with the precious blood. Now obey. Grace doesn't just leave you with rejecting the law and doing whatever you want. It empowers you. It teaches you. It fills you up with an overflow in obedience, in service, in worship. And number four. If you are broken, run to Jesus. If you are broken, run to Jesus. You say, Sam, I'm broken. I'm a mess. You don't know what a mess I've made of my life. Jesus will never accept me. Can I quote Jesus himself to you? John 6. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Whoever comes to me. He doesn't say, if you've lived a perfect life, if you come to me, I will never cast you out. He says, whoever. If you've messed up in your life, come to me. I will not cast you out. Remember the story of the prodigal son that Jesus says, teaches us he's, This man wastes his entire life, blows all of his money, and he ends up in a pig pen competing with swine for pig food. And yet look at the father's response, which is the same response that God gives you and I. Luke 15, And he arose and he came to his father, and while he was still a far way off, the father saw him, had compassion, ran to him, embraced him. He kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned before you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. But the father turns, looks at the servants and says, Bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. Put shoes on his feet. Bring the best 
steak that you have. Let's kill it. Let's eat it. Let's celebrate for this is my son. He was dead, but he's alive. He was lost, but he's found. And they began to celebrate. And listen, if you have screwed up, if you've messed up, if you come to Jesus, this is the response that Jesus gives you this morning. He welcomes you. He rejoices over you. Later in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 23, Jesus would approach the city that was going to crucify him. And instead of pronouncing judgment on the city, he would communicate how much he loves them. He would say in that passage that his desire was to gather the people under his wings and to protect them. And in a short time from saying that statement, Jesus would go into Jerusalem and he would gather a people and gather them together by going to the cross and providing a covering and atonement and satisfy the wrath that God had on us. National Geographic told a story about a forest fire in Yosemite National Park. Some rangers were scouring the park after the fire and found a bird of which nothing was left but the carbonized, petrified shell covered in ashes huddled at the base of a tree. And the ranger, using a stick, knocked the bird over um, and three tiny little chicks scurried out from under their dead mother's wings. During the fire, the mother had apparently remained steadfast instead of running because she was willing to die. Those under the cover of her wings lived. Don't you see the disposition of God towards you as one of mercy? It's the same disposition that you will find no matter where you are today in life. Divine mercy is not a temporary mood of God, but it's an attribute of the eternal God. Thus, we as Christians have no need to fear that someday that mercy will cease or run out. There is an infinite amount of mercy with our God. Great is thy faithfulness. Your mercies are new when every single morning. When you woke up this morning, God gave you a brand new set of mercies. It's as if, it's as if God was giving you a checkbook of mercy and you can continue to withdraw with no fear that, there were, that your check would ever bounce. No matter where you are with Jesus this morning, if you're a Christian, there are no hoops for you to jump through, no penance that needs to be performed, no absolution that needs to be done by another human being. You can go straight to God through Jesus and plead for mercy and grace, and it is yours. That is why the veil was ripped in two from top to bottom, because we have access to the Father. A.W. Tozer would say this way, we may plead for mercy for a lifetime in unbelief, and at the end of our days, be still no more than sadly hopeful that we shall somewhere, sometime receive it. This is a starved to death just outside the banquet hall in which we have been warmly invited to. Or we may, if we will, lay hold of the mercy of God by faith, enter the hall, sit down with bold and avid souls who would not allow unbelief to keep us from the feast that is prepared for us. You're welcome to the table. No matter where you've been, what you've done, there is a seat for you at the table of God. Isaiah seeks the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to his God that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon Christian, when you remember, meditate, and dive deep into the mercy of God for you in Jesus, you will become a more merciful person. You will begin to see people with the disposition of mercy instead of the disposition of judgment. It will change you from being self-righteous to being more like Jesus. As we come to communion this morning, if you are a follower of Jesus in this room, can I invite you to take time to reflect on this story and the implications that we talked about. Ask God to search you. Ask God to try you this morning. Ask him to bring to the surface things that you have buried deep in your soul. Maybe it's vices that you need to repent of. Maybe it's wounds that you have tried to forget that Jesus wants to heal. When you're ready, can I invite you to come and partake of communion, being reminded that we serve a merciful Savior.
If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, same words apply to you. There are no hoops for you to jump through. There's no penance that you need to do. There's no absolution that another man needs to do for you. You can cry out to Jesus yourself this morning. This morning, you can come to Jesus just as you are, knowing that there is room for you. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, can I invite you, don't leave here this morning unless you know him. This morning in the back, there are individuals that are ready and available to pray with you. If you need someone to pray with you this morning, I invite you, just walk back there, have them pray with you. Where two or three agree together, it will be done. Join them in prayer this morning. I invite you to get out of your seats, meet with them before you come and take communion. Examine your hearts this morning. Run to the merciful Savior. Picture the merciful Father running to you, embracing you, loving on you. And as you do, as you come and celebrate communion, May your heart overflow in worship for a God who has forgiven us and shown us more mercy than we can ever imagine. Would you worship Jesus with us this morning?